My name's Alex. I am the, the, the founder of transgenderabuse.org. I do most of my activism in helping uh, young women, especially ones that are formally identifying as trans. So I suppose we can understand them to be detransitioners. Um, I do a lot of uh, journalism and research into uh, Planned Parenthood specifically because, you know, I feel that they are at the apex of the, the evil trans lobby. I'm delivering a lot of hard truths. Uh, anybody that's ever looked at my website or any of my writing, I use very direct, non-euphemistic ways to discuss uh, surgeries, to discuss the effects of hormones, and I use lots of pictures and uh, detailed explanations. Uh, I also have a ongoing project which is called Gender Offenders. This is a international project where I'm gathering uh, lots of different testimonies from different people who have suffered at the hands of gender doctors worldwide. So I think it's very important for us to, uh, to really uh, stay focused when we're talking about Planned Parenthood and really uh, just forget everything that we used to think about them and everything that we think that we know. I know people who have, um, who are now, you know, working very much firmly with me, who used to formally uh, collect money for Planned Parenthood. We know that they are weaponized as a tool by both right-wing and left-wing sources to try and say, you know, defund Planned Parenthood or fund Planned Parenthood, right? And I feel as women, we are especially abused in this way to support uh, Planned Parenthood. So the first thing I think that is very important that we start to talk about is, are you familiar with the term ROGD? Yes. Okay. So just for anybody that doesn't know what that is, that is referring to rapid onset gender dysphoria. It is the, the, the term that, that describes the type of gender dysphoria, which seems to be affecting only females and only females between the ages of about 13 to 18. So you can think of it as, you know, almost like the new anorexia. Okay. A lot of these detransitioners or former sufferers of ROGD they will tell you that one of the main components that led them to believe this dangerous belief that they're born in the wrong body was Tumblr, okay? So Tumblr, already we know, is not a great place. They have no problem in promoting self-harm to vulnerable women, vulnerable girls, eating disorders. We know that from our generation, that that was very popular. And now they're really forcing, I think, gender ideology onto the young people. If you go onto Tumblr, it's a sewer. So that really, I think, uh, should have been the first red flag for Planned Parenthood because in 2014, their CEO went ahead and joined. Now, that seems to me to be utterly crazy that this person, uh, you know, David Clark knew. If you Google it, you will see he doesn't even shy away from this. So then in 2016 to 2017, Planned Parenthood started offering LGBT services, okay? So these services are are only hormones, okay? They don't give you a lick of therapy. They don't give you any referrals unless perhaps it's for surgery. And they don't even evaluate to see if you really do have gender dysphoria. They just uh, seem to have picked this population of people, which would be teenagers and you know LGB. And they've said, we're gonna capture them. And they have very successfully managed to capture them. And Planned Parenthood is, I think, that we need to also emphasize that they are responsible for teaching sex education in many states uh, and also internationally. Okay, they're responsible for teaching sex education and uh, they're, they're teaching concepts and ideas which are antithetical to the women's rights movement uh, and also, I think, to children's rights as well. In 2018, their abortion rate went down. Planned Parenthood should have been celebrating that. But I think that they started to really panic about their funding and about their, their money. Okay. I think from the whole, I don't know what you think, but I really think this is a, an absolute match made in hell. They had the hashtag tech stands with PP. Okay. Which is, you know, from the outset, if it wasn't so sinister, it would be great. If they weren't handing out hormones to confuse teenagers, then that would be wonderful. But knowing now what we know, how dark and how sinister, I mean, I have a physical aversion to even looking at this. 
Yeah, and and something you know to note about Pan Parenthood also is that the the founder is one of the, the leaders of the eugenics movement, along yeah. with Bill Gates Senior. And so, this isn't actually so surprising to those who understand the history of Planned Parenthood mm-hmm. as an establishment, as a for profit company. And you know, I know plenty of women who are highly critical of hormonal birth control, for example, and sterilizing. Mm-hmm. Um, primarily women of color, right? Mm-hmm. Which they've been doing yeah. all along. That is their actually, that is their mission essentially, mm-hmm. but who will shy away from any critique, right? Holding on really, really, really tightly to the fact that Planned Parenthood offers medicalized abortion. It feels so precious to so many women that to go there mm-hmm. to, to critique the sterilization of young girls mm-hmm. and women to critique uh, now the new way in which the sterilization is happening through puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, it, it feels mm-hmm. sacrosanct to so many. And yeah, I, I agree. We really need to break down this, this sacrosanct you know, idea of Planned Parenthood. It is, yeah. it was never there. They were never holy. And the, the kind of evil that, that they are promoting now with sterilizing children is beyond, mm-hmm. you know, even the most kind of insidious origin. So, so yeah, yeah. I, I'm in total agreement. Yeah. And I think it's also very, um, I do believe that women like you, um, you know, cause you are a little bit younger than me and I know that you, you did come from the healthcare space, listening to, to you and the way that you were, you know, so excited to be working in healthcare and supporting young women. And you would go to your family and say, do you know now that men can give birth? You know, I really feel, I feel on some level that that's, that's really abusive that, you know, how you were taught. Uh, to believe these things. In a way, I feel like a lot of these Planned Parenthood uh, workers and all of the people who have, are supporting them and continue to support them, they are under some form of mind control um, because there is such a cognitive dissidence uh, when somebody says, I stand for Planned Parenthood and you're saying, okay, right, so you stand for Planned Parenthood but can we talk about the problematic history of Planned Parenthood or the problematic present? No, I can't do that because you're a fascist right-wing a psycho or you're uh, an evil Christian. They've really captured the, the narrative and weaponized it. They've weaponized the language as well so that young women are not allowed to talk freely about Planned Parenthood because you will be accused of being all kinds of things. Uh, you know, you will be accused of being anti-women. You will be accused of marching in step with the with the Christian right and all, all of this other stuff, which is just not true. And I think it's really important because I do feel like young women will be at the forefront of this movement, need to be told these things. So in front of you, you can see the slide that I'm using. So this young woman, she's, she's now thankfully desisted. I really feel like she's a very powerful image uh, to really describe what drives these young girls to believe such damning things like they're born in the wrong body. So um, this young girl really talks quite candidly about her internalized homophobia and how this was not explored at all. This case actually happened in the UK, but it could have easily just as happened at Planned Parenthood. So now we see Planned Parenthood are the the number two, I think maybe number one provider of cross-sex hormones. All you need to do to get it is you rock up yourself, make an appointment, okay? Tell them any kind of garbage, really. Uh, I know of a mom who went to Planned Parenthood to test this out and she she went uh, dressed, you know, in jeans and a t-shirt and said, yeah, I, I saw Caitlyn Jenner is doing so well and I just figured, I might have a go at, you know, trying out the other sex goal. She was affirmed and she was uh, given the prescription for testosterone. So informed consent is 100% the rule of thumb, which means you go in and you sign the informed consent. The informed consent is misleading, I think, as well, which I can show you as we get into it. Planned Parenthood are now, I believe, in they're firmly in the eugenics kind of category of this uh i i would say in in terms of the sort of the the trans rights activist sphere you very much uh, have big fertility uh, slammed in there and you also very much have big pharma slammed in there and i think that 
Planned Parenthood are instrumental in the big pharma capture of uh, young people, specifically, I would say young women are very, very much at risk. When they say things like, how long do you need to take testosterone? This is taking the position immediately that any woman needs to take testosterone. And of course, no woman needs to take testosterone. Okay, immediately there, that's the first lie. I think as well that they really don't emphasize some of that, what I think are the emotional changes which happen. Uh, when you speak to a lot of the women who are on testosterone for a while, they really openly tell you that uh, they had increased instances of violence and uh, anger. I know of a woman who said that she was an absolute uh, danger on the road. Because, uh, you know, with testosterone naturally, it makes perfect sense. It would fill you with other feelings that you don't normally have. Uh, we know this because think about the, the changes which happen when a woman may go on birth control. You know, she can all of a sudden start to feel dra do drastically different things. So the idea that we're going to be allowing a 17-year-old girl who is already in a vulnerable position uh, to go make a decision about getting on testosterone and then framing it as a good thing, it just seems institutionally supported self-harm. I, I don't know really how else I would call it. Then the subject of can I get pregnant? Now, we know from... Every time one of these trans-identified females gets pregnant, we know that we are subjected to several articles about how wonderful it is and about how great it is and about how fabulous it is, okay? We don't know the effects that these children are going to face, okay? And, you know, we, we know that these women can get pregnant on testosterone. However, they say, if you have sex with a person who makes sperm, I know that they're talking about a man, but I don't think that a 17-year-old would be able to, or a 17-year-old maybe that's on the autistic spectrum would be able to decipher any of that, okay? They very sneakily say, you know, your health is important to us. I don't think their health is important to them at, at all. I, I really think at this point, Planned Parenthood does not care whatsoever. The typical procedure for when you want to get testosterone from Planned Parenthood, you turn up, they will prick your finger. I assume when they're pricking your finger, they may be checking for diabetes, uh, but they don't weigh the patients, which I think is very, uh, very negligent as well, because, you know, people will tell you that testosterone, once you're on it for a while, it has massive effects on, on your heart. And you know, uh, many women have passed away, unfortunately, from effects from, from testosterone. Uh, so then they, they say this, which I think is just, this is a kicker. Uh, what are the benefits? Now, there is no benefits. Or how can we say that this is a benefit? How can you say with any confidence? Or how can you say it and still go home and look at yourself in the mirror at night that there is a benefit to testosterone, which includes your clitoris getting bigger. Sometimes it gets, you know, so big and it never goes back. So it's like, you know, this seems to me to be leading that these are benefits. Now there is one of these listed benefits, which I think is very dangerous uh, because they, they say here, you will notice less fat on your buttocks, hips, thighs, and more on your body and more on your belly. So we know already from speaking to a lot of the detransitioners that they have um, unequal levels of eating disorders. Girls with eating disorders are way more, they're overrepresented in the numbers of girls who are, are claiming a, uh, a trans identity. And that makes perfect sense because uh, a woman who is hating her body to such an extent that she's starving, she is likely also to do other things like go on testosterone. Have you in your experience ever uh, delivered a baby or ever helped to from one of these uh, trans identified females? I have not. And it is so um, interesting that, that that would be the case or obvious because first of all, it's still such a small percentage of the population, even with the rapid growth, it's still, you know, a very small percentage of the population. And, you know, uh, it, it's ridiculous to, given what I've gone through indoctrination wise in terms of language to have served, yeah. you know, uh, nearly a hundred women 
giving birth and more than 300 families postpartum breastfeeding prenatal counseling and not one you know i've never been in a situation where someone asked me to refer to their vagina as a front hole now i have friends i have friends who have served these women and they describe it to me as you know having to play pretend yeah right so you're I- working with someone who's extremely mentally fragile and instead of giving instead of doulas being giving counsel as to work with people who are that mentally kind of dissociated that Mm -hmm. that that to use the word vagina will trigger them into like some kind of panic attack instead of having the tools to deal with that doulas are told to ask ahead of time what the pronouns are, what they like their body parts to be referred to as. And, you know, now it's, you know, I think if I did a doula training now, it might be a different, I think, I think I would probably come across more women identifying as trans. And there's a website, maybe you're familiar, it's called Mm transfertility.co. And it's all about how to act and speak when you are serving trans identified women and the whole focus is obviously affirmation and the trans is beautiful and that there's nothing to see here and like don't you dare ask anything of, to do with you know testosterone and the fact that if they're you know going to be at higher risk of complication and all and, and what it means to bring a child into the world who thinks they were born from a father so cruel there is going to be several i believe there are going to be many women who are coming from that industry, who will, will feel like they've gone through some, something very traumatic, you know, being forced to, to call people uh, strange names and uh, forced also to take part, I think, in it. Because it's, uh, it, it is incredibly unfair to force somebody to take part in something uh, which they may realize later on in life has actually really affected them. I wonder about the sanity of a lot of these dispensers, a lot of these, you know, random nurses that work in Planned Parenthood who may be responsible for inadvertently dispensing this medication to people. I really worry about their um, well-being when it comes to fruition, just how damaging all, all of this has been. They may feel like they've taken part in something quite terrible. And the people that are supporting the women, they're also going on, uh, going under an immense amount of stress because they're, they're trying to care about this, this person. And imagine being bullied and told, stop referring to me as a mother, refer to me as this. I, I would just feel so beaten down, I think, because it, it so completely goes against everything that you and I know to be true about us as women. I'm not a birth giver. I'm not a, a birth parent. I'm not a chest feeder. I'm none of these things. And it's so dehumanizing, I think, to use this type of language. That's why the, the erasure of female language, it, it affects us on so many levels. Because if we now cannot with confidence say who a woman is, right? If I cannot say Jane is a woman because she's female, then we're in big problems. We're in big, we're in a big issue here. There are things which affect us as women. We are more susceptible to discrimination. We are more susceptible to male violence. And if we can't even talk about who we are as women, then we're never going to be able to tackle all of the issues that we already have. And I think that the capture of healthcare is particularly pernicious in the way that it seems to be abusing women really on all, on all levels. You know, Planned Parenthood really does continue, I think, with, with the lies. They start to talk about that things like the, um, vaginal atrophy may be reversible. And I think that that's, that's no, you know, people know that this is not the case. It's not reversible. I think that none of these things which they're providing and which they're saying are necessarily true. And I especially don't think that the benefits they're claiming are really benefits. So now, now we get on to the issue of the influencers, okay? You mentioned Willow, and I think that she's a very uh, good example of how 
a, a girl can very easily go onto YouTube and kind of watch on repeat these very addictive videos um, about how to con your doctor or con your healthcare provider into giving you these medications. And we know from our generation of women that this is typically the kind of behavior that anorexics used to um, exhibit because you ever know if you had two anorexic girls together, they're immediately swapping tips about how to put weights in your pocket or this is how you would look like you've actually had dinner when you haven't. So it seems to me to be pretty old trope what they're doing and incredibly transparent. Uh, but these are just a couple of snapshots of true stories that I've collected when I was talking about people who were given testosterone from Planned Parenthood. I was given testosterone after a 20-minute exam. That was a, a mother who went in to, to see whether or not she could be prescribed. Another mother told me that she found out that her kid was prescribed via SMS. So just got an, a random SMS because I, I assume because they were on the, the health insurance plan. Uh, another woman said, my daughter has a massive cholesterol of 160. So again, this is taking on to the heart problems. They should never be on testosterone. And another woman told me my daughter just walked in because she was bored, okay? And th this shouldn't surprise us because I was a teenage girl and I did some really questionable stuff. We know that teenage girls, they will take ecstasy on a night out because they wanna see what it's like. Uh, so the idea that the kids would be experimenting with us, it makes perfect sense. And us as adults uh, who know better should be able to stand in front of them and safeguard a little bit. And I don't feel like there's any real safeguarding going on here. It seems as if it's affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. I think the biggest crime of Planned Parenthood in all of this is potentially that you can walk in off the street with uh, a homeless person. You can pay them 20 bucks to say that they're your guardian or whatever. And you can actually guess it if you're under 18. So on their informed consent, they do have a place for legal guardians and they don't check to see whether or not this person really is a legal guardian. We also know that people who are identifying as trans when they're teenagers disproportionately represented, represented in the foster care system. So that should really raise some serious red flags because foster kids, we know already from, from 30 years of hearing about the foster care system, a lot of these kids do have some, some real problems, are very damaged, and of course, many of them are going to want to take on another identity. Uh, did you recently hear about the trans-identified male in Ireland who was from the foster care system? No, no. Tell, tell me about him. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, this is, a, this is probably um, the worst ever example of self-ID, right? The worst ever most dangerous example of self-ID. For anybody who doesn't know what self-ID is, self-ID really means that you can identify yourself what gender you are without having to undergo any kind of anything, right? Not, you don't even need to kind of put on a bit of, of lipstick. Any man can be a woman. The story of they call themselves Barbie Kardashians. This male is extremely damaged. Uh, you know, as a child, they endured all kinds of abuse, all kinds of terrible things. And they were in the foster care system. And in the foster care system, he decided to take on this new uh, female identity, start calling himself Barbie Kardashian, and to kind of uh, adopt a, a female social uh, role, perhaps. But, you know, they were also incredibly violent and they've been arrested for, I think, I think attempted murder, trying to kill their foster care parents. And now they are housed in the women's estate in Ireland. So that really does, I think, indicate how far you can get with a bit of language, right? When we're told all the time to use pronouns because it's kind, this is where it leads you, I believe. Uh, when we start to violate our own sensibilities and our own understanding of language, we can really go quite far with that. We see now if Barbie Kardashian is a she and is a woman, now of course Barbie Kardashian should be in the women's prison. You know what I mean? It's, it, that's obvious. And it's only a feat of language. This is, that's all that has been accomplished. So that's very much when we, when we see the, the mantra, trans women are women. I don't know about you, but I used to think that they were talking about 
trans women are women because they need to be accepted as women and, and, and not discriminated against for their gender identity. But they really mean, no, they are female. Uh, they are absolutely female in, in every way, just indecipherable uh, as to you and me. And questioning that is, of course, transphobic. And, and in some cases, there are some men who are pretending to be women who claim that they are actually better versions of women, right? And you see well, this with are. Caitlyn Jenner, right? You see like the, what, what money can get you. Money can get you to look like, you know, a very hyper-sexualized, fetishized woman. And, yeah. and, you know, I remember people just praising him Bruce Jenner saying, you know, how, how beautiful he was, how, how gorgeous and, and how like he, he really was a beautiful, beautiful woman. And just the absurdity mm -hmm. of the misogynistic beauty standards that trans women will uh, take on and then be praised for. Right. And, and this is, you know, I know you've heard this, but the, the kind of the culture around referring to grown men who call themselves women, referring to them as girls, the girls, the girls, the girls are coming mm -hmm. over. The, I know a girl, they're a girl. It, it is, it is the most disgusting and really embedded, you know, I think pedophilic as well to refer to these grown men as girls. Mm -hmm. This is, it's, it, it, it's, it's fine. As you said, it's mind control. It's, it's mind control. Perversion. Mm -hmm. It is, it is complete absurdity. And yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also, uh, I think as well, um, uh, it's, it's very powerful to remember that Caitlyn Jenner uh, was the, the oldest uh, so-called woman ever to be on the cover of Vanity Fair. So if that doesn't show you that there is a disproportionate level of love afforded these people, okay? Uh, when I say these people, I'm really not trying, I'm talking about autogynophiles. This is what I mean. Um, I'm not talking about, you know, your kind of your, your, your individual who wants to be stealth. Okay, Caitlyn Jenner has made a, a career now out of being this, uh, out of being, you know, Caitlyn Jenner, uh, won awards for bravery. Uh, no woman could ever do that. I mean, and, and then says, oh, the hardest part of being a woman is deciding what to wear. No, it's, it's probably FGM. Maybe it's forced marriage, dying during childbirth. Maybe that's something that's, that we should address. And, and if Caitlyn Jenner has said that, if Caitlyn Jenner had gone on and said, you know what, I'm, I'm a woman and now I'm going to champion forced marriage in India and had gone out there and campaigned, I might have a little bit of respect for that uh, because it wouldn't seem so completely trite. Because all I see is a, is, is a man who's got a fetish for cross-dressing and wants us all to play along. You, you mentioned that, that, that Bruce Jenner is distinct from a man who wants to be stealth, but even the man who wants to be stealth, that's also pretty fucking concerning if that stealthy man then wants to access women's bathrooms and locker rooms. You know, like what you do in your home, the way how, the way you dress, breast implants, whatever whatever an individual wants to do, that that is that is distinct from then self IDing as a woman and demanding access, you know, to to women's yeah, spaces. Well, of course, a hundred percent. And and the thing is, is the the problem. All of this really can very much go back to sort of the the adoration that we have for the trans women in the, 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 the sort of the trope, right? The, the religious worship of the trans women, because without them and their assertions that they needed to be transitioned as children, we would not have trans children, okay? Instead of understanding that what a trans woman is, is a man with a variant sexuality. It's another sexual, you know, have you read the work of Ray Blanchard? Are you referring to autogynophilia? Yeah. Beyond that. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, this is widely now widely known, right? So uh, Ray Blanchard started off, um, he, you know, had his sex clinic. He very much wants to understand what is it that drives somebody to these types of conclusions. So he understood that there were men who would, you know, the term autogynophilia uh, literally would uh, fall in love with the idea of themselves as women heterosexual men who would create a girlfriend for themselves out of their bodies and it is obviously it's a it's a fetish uh th this was later taken on by michael uh, bailey uh who wrote the the book the men who would be queen which is just 
a really great insight into this whole thing. I mean, it's disturbing, but it really gives you a very black and white approach. And it continues more into the work of Anne Lawrence, who then goes on, at, Anne Lawrence is a trans woman, and she wrote the book Men Trapped in Men's Bodies. And it's, it's fab, fabulous insight into this fetish. So once you know all of this, right, and you know that this is, this is a very male uh, heterosexual sexuality, don't you feel a bit abused that you were forced to call Caitlyn Jenner she and her uh, and you were scolded if you didn't? Yeah, I think it's, you know, one of my biggest frustrations in all this is just wanting people to admit that they were duped. You know, mm -hmm. I was duped. Many of the women I know were duped. Mm -hmm. It is, it is enraging to be on the other side of this and, and learn that you were endorsing this kind of absurdity and misogyny and homophobia. It is, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely infuriating, you know, mm -hmm. to, to see, you know, I think it's like once a week that the New York Times has some kind of ridiculous article about trans rights, which is yeah. code for men's rights, men's uh, rights, men's yeah. rights in, in female only spaces. Mm -hmm. I really have to wonder about what this is going to do to the women who are becoming de facto men's rights activists, young women who are full of potential, you know, 20 years old, and they are gung ho for this nonsense, which erases them. Uh, I just feel like, okay, you know, this is, again, I use mind control. It, it is mind control, but it's also something else. It, 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 it is a form of abuse to force these women to go out to bat for these for these men because they're told okay um if you see an instance in your workplace right you need to report that uh woman uh you need to educate her you need to uh, it's it, it operates exactly like a witch hunt and you know just as well as i do that you've been on the um receiving end of some of this misogynistic abuse from other women right Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, beyond. The purpose of what you're doing is so fantastic because you can really be converting a lot of the younger generation that I feel needs to be converted. So this is what I thought maybe if we talk about this, maybe it might pique them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I think the most interesting reactions I think I've received from peers is um, a kind of pathetic pleading like, for example, you know, what, what, what happened to the lovely, compassionate, kind woman that I, that I used to know? Where, where has she gone? And, you know, obviously the answer is she's right. She's right here. She's right here. And she's doing the work that, that many other women are afraid to do you know, for good reason, you know, it's this, the, the risks are not to be played down, but I think women who are on the edge of speaking out really have to think about, you know, are they prepared to be given the label transphobic? Because that comes with the territory and, yeah, you know, it's, it's just part of the game. So, so yeah, I mean, speaking out about this as, and actually, you know, I think part of my motivation also for speaking out is having been on the receiving end of the divisiveness and, and watching this ideology tear my friendships apart, tear my, my professional relationships apart. Yeah. Um, losing clients over mm -hmm. this, you know, that is not, that is, no. that crosses no. the line beyond. Uh, and it, yeah, it just really speaks to kind of the, the divisiveness of the ideology and why we really need to dismantle it for protection of women and children specifically um, mm -hmm. men are collateral damage in this as well they absolutely mm -hmm. are but they are not the target they are the collateral no, damage not. they mm -hmm. they you know that the, we were talking about earlier you know this through the sissy hypno porn right it is being these messages this ideology is being fed through all sorts of channels of, of programming specifically porn to men but it's no surprise that more fathers aren't coming forward to say like this shit needs to stop because they are, they're not losing out.
in all of this. It's women. It's women and girls. Women, women and girls. And I really wish that I had more fathers who I'm in contact with because I'm not in contact with a lot of fathers. I'm in contact with hundreds, if not thousands, of of mothers of rapid onset gender dysphoria uh, girls, and hardly any fathers are getting involved. And that really, really upsets me because. I feel that throughout this whole movement, and and I don't know if you can uh, uh, you have an affinity with this. I feel like because of everything that's happening with this aggressive totalitarian movement, I really need to mend uh, my my perception of men and mend my kind of my relationship in a way with sort of the the greater men in the world. But I don't mean you know men that I know personally. I mean right now I have these these very negative feelings when I'm thinking about men and I did not used to have them I used to really not and it's and it's really because I feel like we have been violated in such a big way by this movement by this men's rights activist movement by the trans activist movement that I feel like maybe I will never uh, be able to to see men as comrades if you want uh, in in the in the fight for women's rights and that was not always the case for me. I very much felt supported, for example, five years ago, talking about the sex industry and the Nordic model. I had many men supporting me in that. Many fathers who had lost daughters to pimps uh, and to Johns. I wonder why, are, why is this not why is this not waking up some of the men out there? Why are they not coming out and fighting for us? That's interesting. I, I, I guess I, I feel differently. I, I feel that this issue has just illuminating the deep kind of woman hating that, 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 that makes the world turn. And I think like you're speaking to fathers who've lost their daughters to pimps, like the only reason why they're involved is because it has affected them directly. You know what I mean? And I think for men, that's what it takes. I don't think that's what it takes for women. I think women have a different kind of um, calling to to safeguarding ourselves in our community because, you know, men men don't have the kind of, it's just the same threat. So, so I think that, I don't know that anything has changed in my perspective of men. It, it, it just has become increasingly clear what yeah. already was you know, yeah. and, and yeah, I think it is important to highlight, you know, just for the sake of like, in, it, it's sick that we'd have to like incentivize men to get involved. But I think the mm-hmm. sissy hypno porn is quite the hook when men oh. find out, you know, that they could be, that they could think that they're clicking on just standard abusive denigrating porn and then be fed hypnotic messages that they don't want or need their penises. You know, I think that's enough to get a lot of men's attention. And so if, if I have to talk more about sissy hypno porn, I will to get, to get more men involved. But yeah, I think it takes a, a personal direct experience with losing Mm -hmm. your daughter to a pimp or you know your 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 wife you know wanting to castrate your son to to get to get men involved yeah so so i think that um when we're we're talking about uh planned parenthood i think that the uh, when we get back to planned parenthood and the message that they're putting out there it's really important to come back to this idea about language and how, like we said before, we were abused. I feel like I was a little bit abused when I was told to call Caitlin uh, uh, she and her. And that was a linguistic thing. So what Planned Parenthood are doing is they have all of the infrastructure to be dishing out these hormones. Uh, Now they need to create the patients. And I do believe they are creating patients here. So they give out their sex education through organizations like Listen. So Glisten, very much similar to Stonewall, had a fantastic reputation for standing up for the rights of gay people. And now they have just been completely co-opted. Uh, and now they're just totally antithetical to the whole movement. And we see this very much when we look at this nonsense that, 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 that they're um, sharing. So they say the gender triangle that your attribution is how you are perceived by others. Your gender identity is this magical thing, which is how you see yourself on the inside. Your expression is how you present yourself. 
and your body is how your body exists and changes. So they are pushing the narrative that your real self is never your body. You are not your body. Your body is not you. And in your head, you have the magic of gender identity, which will set you free. And we know this is total nonsense because if that was true, then there wouldn't be a self-harm component to this. Uh, there wouldn't be, I don't believe that you ever need to have plastic surgery, elective cosmetic surgery to reveal how wonderful you are. It's incredibly important for us to really critically examine this language that they are using to talk to children. So this is in their glossary, okay? So this is what they're teaching children, uh, I believe that are nine years old. So they say, the more all of these aspects align, the more you may identify as cisgender and experience cis privilege. For example, if you identify as a boy who with bodily traits and expression that are attributed to masculinity within your culture, then you experience privilege. Cisgender people often get to move through the world without thinking about gender, being misgendered, or feeling limited by gender stereotypes. Uh, we understand this is so dangerous because, first of all, we're, to, we're actively encouraging people not to be so quote-unquote cisgender because who wants to be in, in a position of a horrible oppressor, uh, someone who's uh, hogging all the privilege. No one wants to be that, right? This is what they're saying. And it's, to me, it's no surprise the amount of girls who no longer want to be quote unquote cisgender. They now want to identify into the um, victim class. It makes no sense. The, the part, all of it is obviously garbage, but especially the part where it says cisgender people often get to move through the world without thinking about gender what garbage w women are the most stigmatized and the most targeted for, and abused for not complying with mm -hmm. harmful gender stereotypes so so this idea that that we don't have to worry uh, yeah. It's just, it is, it is such double speak and confusion and yeah, like you said, that's a really good point. Like no one wants to think that they're like the most privileged, like nobody, not nobody wants to, that no, they, uh, that they want. And so they're saying to avoid that. Oh, but then they're also as a forewarning, I'm also reading a forewarning that when they, that what they're saying as well is when the transition is complete you may also then experience privilege mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. cisgender. Oh my God, it is so, so it, weird. It's so terrible. They use words, which I feel is just so ab abusive and so crazy. They're teaching this to 10 year olds. So I think this is, you know, uh, how confusing. They say, misgendering refers to the experience of being labeled by others as a gender other than the one you are. So that's not good because they're saying that you can self-identify and that we need to walk around and ask people the pronouns. If somebody asks me my pronouns, walks out up to them in the street, uh, you know, uh, out of the blue and say, uh, are you he or she? I'd be like, can you fuck off? I mean, what is this? No we know readily sex is real and it's readily perceivable, okay? There are, of course, hyper uh, effeminate uh, men, but we very much perceive them to be men. I know they're men, you know they're men. Uh, and this idea that we have to ask pronouns, they then say, if you accidentally use the words wrong pronouns for someone, make sure you correct yourself going forward. How authoritarian is that? Right. I was talking to the D programmer XX about this recently, um, that it used to be people would, would ask you politely, like, these are my preferred pronouns. And now you can be criminally punished in mm -hmm. certain states and in Canada, for example, mm -hmm. for quote unquote, misgendering someone mm -hmm. this is absurd and like this is so confusing for an english speaker let alone someone who yeah where where english is their second language i mean can you imagine the money that could be made at targeting like legally targeting 
for like people who are unknowingly misgendering too? We see now uh, in, in the past couple of years, trans activists have brought vexatious prosecutions against women for things like misgendering. Megan Murphy was one. We saw Megan Murphy, she, was, she didn't have a vexatious prosecution, but uh, she was tossed off of Twitter for saying men can't be women. Uh, Linda Bellos was also, I think, was also the, the target of a vexatious prosecution on the basis, I believe, of misgendering. Posey Parker is another one, although I, I think that what she did is she, she criticized the mermaids to the green, that evil, evil, evil woman uh, who castrated her child. Do you know what Susie Green said about her son? That he looked, he looked like, as a baby, he looked like a member of the village people. So this exposes her whole homophobic agenda because the village people were not effeminate little, little boys. They were masculine gay men in uniform. So she is just, she's just a homophobe. That's all that she is. And she's allowed to go around the world preaching this nonsense about born in the wrong body, which is so toxic and so damning and so dangerous. And anybody who criticizes her is thrown off of Twitter, interrogated by the police. This is scary stuff, really, really scary stuff. And Posey Parker, I understand that within our movement, she may be a divisive individual, but she is absolutely correct in what she said. She did castrate her child. Can you imagine that that gets a police investigation? Mm -hmm. And I appreciate, I, I also, you know, practice this in, in my work too, speaking very directly, avoiding euphemisms. And they're mm -hmm. really hard to get around sometimes because of words like transition. You know, even mm -hmm. the words transition. I'm moving away from even using that. No, there, there, there was a woman who took testosterone for five years and she had a double mastectomy. But to say that she transitioned implies that, that there is a destination with all this, that, 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 that it is possible that she can get to the destination of becoming male, which we know is absurd. And then women can't become I, men and men can't become women. I also think that, you know, beyond the word transition, uh, transition is absolutely not the correct word for this. Uh, but I also don't want to hurt people's feelings. And I do have a tendency to call it mutilation. Um, and I know that that may hurt some feelings. But my, my intention with using words like mutilation is not to denigrate the choices of, of people who now realize the mistakes that they've made. It's to try and prevent parents and young girls mainly uh, going down this path and having top surgery, okay, double mastectomy, top surgery. These words, they need to be not just banished from the lexicon. Top surgery, it does not convey the truth of what you're doing to that young person, uh, to that 12 year old. And I've seen on TikTok, because I follow all of these people on TikTok, top surgery is very popular, very popular hashtag amongst young girls. So all day they're watching these kind of 20 second clips of women who hate their breasts so much that they chop them off. And there's these beautiful surgeons, you know, a lot, a lot of the time these surgeons are female, young and quite inspirational. You know, they, they're inspirational doctors who see themselves as LGBT activists. They're anything but. They're just women haters or they're self haters. I don't know what would how can something as illogical as gender identity capture the medical community in such a profound way? It's absurd. I know the doctor you're talking about, Dr. Gallagher. Mm -hmm. She is insidious. And also it should be noted that she, it's interesting, she's, she, she somewhat performs hyperfemininity as well. There's some, yeah. there's like a, a kind of a, a soullessness to her stare and the way that she poses with her patients if you want to call them patients after victims. the surgeries the victims exactly the victims is so asinine and also very tokenizing too if anything if anything i would hope that trans identified uh youth would see her as tokenizing them i mean that that come on i mean that is just the bare minimum of what she's doing the idea that she wakes up in the morning and she just thinks, okay, so now I'm going to slice some healthy breasts off of young women and I'm doing the right thing. I am doing a service. I am part of the gay rights movement. It's just, 
it makes me sick it really does and i think that we need to prosecute her in the future the way that we prosecute war criminals this is what i think i agree i agree i absolutely mm. agree so what you're looking at here is the gender terminology is a discussion so what they've actually done is they've taken judith butler's queer theory and they've re re replaced a couple of words here so they say that gender identity is how they see themselves everyone gets to decide their gender oh my god it's just if that's not leading someone then i don't know what is it's supposed to be framed as being liberating you know the idea that anybody can be a woman and a woman can be anything but it's not it's so oppressive women do not get to decide their gender women are absolutely born into it no wonder it's so lucrative to young girls to think that they can all of a sudden migrate out of the class that is uh, sexualized, migrated out of the class that suffers all kinds of violence at the hands of men. It sounds so great. So they say you may identify as a boy or a girl. If you don't feel like a boy or girl, you might identify as agender, genderqueer or non-binary. So non-binary, I think, takes us on to just a very, I think, probably the most confusing of all of the terms and it's so widely accepted now i saw jimmy kimmel interview someone who was using they them uh, pronouns and, and telling everybody how great it is and we need to remember that non-binary people people who say they're non-binary they're also self-harming they're also taking estrogen to try and achieve what exactly you know what I'm saying? At least if somebody is transitioning from male to female, there's a point. Right. What are well, you what are you doing? It's there's no well, there's no virtue. You left out the, you know, you didn't mention the last part, which is the or just a person, you know, which is the least virtuous, the least interesting, the least mm -hmm. um profitable, right? So you and I would fall under the category just a person. And also, you know, there are plenty of non-binary self-declared non-binary gender queer a gender women who mm -hmm. are not mutilating their body who are simply rejecting harmful gender stereotypes by the yeah. very vague definition of non-binary and gender queer i think mm -hmm. you and i would fall under that category anyone who isn't performing hyper femininity or adhering to harmful gender stereotypes and roles in the world yeah. could fall under this category and you know it's just this just a person is is the last one on here because it is the most uh you know i think would would be seen under the lgbtqi umbrella as the most regressive mm -hmm. the least educated the least interesting the least colorful uh, and a threat, actually. Yeah. A woman can be uh, gender non-conforming if she really wants to go into STEM or if she's very, very good at, at maths or, you know, it very, she just needs to di divert very slightly from what we expect about women to suddenly be a target, I think, or a so-called gender non-conformer, right? The ideas that we're forcing boys and girls to, I think, nowadays to believe they're anything but non-binary. They are incredibly pinkified, blueified. If anything, we've turned the whole thing up about 200 knots, okay? Queer theory has this whole uh, very centralized idea, and that is that there are binaries, okay? So binaries as in male, female, dark, light, uh, good, bad, okay? And you must deconstruct the binary. So that means that you can deconstruct gender in a way which is, you know, good, right? We want to deconstruct the ideas of, of, of gender, but we're not doing it in any way which is, it means anything. This is something I find very difficult to even say, but uh, they say we are a language-based society and using language is the best way that we learn about new things uh, with each other. If you've ever seen a paint strip in a hardware store, think about how many words we use to describe shades of color. And that's just paint. 
not people's identities. They're right. They're they're applying like the beautiful diversity of the human spirit and desire and personality traits and feelings and applying that to sex, which is mm -hmm. dimorphic. It that is dimorphic. that is so absurd and wow, what a hook. Someone reading yeah. that would say wow all these people who who only see two sexes yeah again like they're regressive they're conventional they're regressive they're stupid yeah and also uh, we need to remember that we're able to look at this with very critical eyes as older people right if we were 10 years old being taught this uh, in a classroom then then we wouldn't have the mental ability to kind of uh to to resist this right we would be totally and utterly swept on totally and completely captured and and we, we would spend hours and hours and hours every day trying to deconstruct our gender, deconstruct our identity, when really it's readily understood and we do not need to be spending so much time thinking about it. Because, of course, that's going to drive a 13-year-old completely mad. I don't know about you, but I wasn't a particularly, I wasn't a particularly confident young 13-year-old uh, girl. I definitely questioned myself in all kinds of ways. And I, I think that if I would have had this additional burden on myself, I would have 100% been swept along into this. I would have identified as non-binary or trans or whatever. And I would have gone down this horribly dangerous route. And that's why I feel the need to scream so loud about it because we understand that w women are naturally going to want to not be part of this binary of course they're going to try and get out of it but we can't we just we just can't and they then go on to say um at the very end in addition having the language to describe one's gender identity outside of the gender binary is liberating and creates community among people experiencing gender in similar ways. We all have the right to have language to define ourselves. Well, not women. We don't have the right to define ourselves with language. What's a woman nowadays? Right, exactly. That's the subtext. Everyone else has the right to claim any word, any pronoun, mm -hmm. except, except for women. Except this for women. Is, I mean, yeah, I mean, wow, that's, we lose, yeah, obviously we're losing the ability to describe ourselves, to classify ourselves as a sex class. It would be so easy to read this and think, wow, so interesting. I would love to learn about how other people experience life and through the world. And yes, it is interesting to learn how men and women reject harmful gender stereotypes. That is a point of intrigue. That is a point of interest that radical feminists have. However, mm -hmm. the insidiousness of this is it takes a natural curiosity and a healthy rejection of harmful stereotypes and it then uses that as an ad campaign to sell lifelong pharmaceuticals and a complete denial of biological reality. Mm -hmm. Right. This alone isn't the, the, the worst of it. This is just the grooming that happens mm -hmm. before to the children, as you mentioned, and adults. And plenty of adults are being groomed into this nonsense as well to then um, offer a solution of the ultimate freedom, right? Liberating. They use the word liberating. Creates community. But yeah, as you mentioned, like an adolescent girl who feels like she doesn't fit in or is confused or doesn't like her body, that there is a community for her mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's going to accept her in every which way that she is. It's so intoxicating because what do we want? What do we want in this world? Community protects us. We know this. Every woman knows that you need to be protected in community. Community is a good thing, has a great idea and word. So um, they're using these, these terms and they're spinning them on their heads. It's an oxymoron. The idea that the describing your gender identity outside of the gender binary is liberating. How is that true? It just seems to me to be under, utterly confusing. And we know it's confusing because now you have young girls who really do believe that they can transition to being the other sex and to have a functioning penis and be able to create sperm. So we know that we're really confusing 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds to really believe some questionable ideas. 
And this is very much similar to a new religion. I always think of it like Scientology. We need to take all of this stuff, all of it, just tear it up, put it in the garbage because it's so useless. And this is way more harmful, I think, than teaching chastity. You know what I'm saying? I feel like this is just so much worse. And how bamboozled would you be if you were taught this at the age of 10? I wouldn't be able to compute it. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't on the spectrum. I didn't, I didn't have learning disabilities. And I think that I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. Yeah, I agree. I hijack a lot of Planned Parenthood webinars and I attend a lot of their training for their, I guess their administrators mainly. They revealed this amazing statistic in their own webinar, which proves rapid onset gender dysphoria. They did a survey of trans-identified youth. This is what they found out. So I want everybody to know that Planned Parenthood, no matter what they say in 20 years time, they knew, they had the evidence in their hands about rapid onset gender dysphoria. Out of all of the trans-identified youths that they pulled, which was I think around 10,000 or something like that, 90.9% of them are assigned female at birth. So women, at that point, Planned Parenthood should say, oh my God, we have to stop everything. Uh, this is unbelievable that we're receiving this many women and women are so overrepresented, but they're proudly presenting this as a good thing. And I don't understand the logic behind it. Either they, they're, they're completely in cahoots with Big Pharma into getting all of these women onto testosterone, or they're just completely captured and stupid. So this is the kind of my, my final part of my, my, my project, which I'd really um, love everybody uh, to get involved with. So I have a map of so-called gender offenders, and I think that it's really important for us to populate this map with as much information as we can. This is an ongoing global project. This is me reaching out to any parents uh, who have been given bad medical advice by uh, doctors or teachers or guidance counselors. I want to create a national directory of, of doctors and nurses and teachers that have been pushing gender identity to such a point where they've really affected their patients. So as you can see here, like these are some real horror stories. Uh, imagine going down to the children's hospital and uh, after an hour and a half, somebody's 13 year old daughter is told, if you're not given testosterone, your daughter is totally gonna kill herself. How emotionally abusive is that? It's almost unfathomable that they would do this. Uh, this person also admitted to putting an, an F2M on hormones after at, at the age of 12. So here we can see all of the gender offenders. And I think it's really important for everybody to become more aware of this and to hopefully add to it uh, so that we can, yeah, so that we can really share, shed some light on this situation. We can actually look at the map in real time. I think that that would be uh, um, maybe even better for us. So this is constantly being updated, constantly being added. So we see here all of the gender offenders. So this is a national project which is being added by mothers, by detransitioners. And, you know, here we can see all of them here. Look at how many of them are Planned Parenthood. So let's just zoom out and this is going to frighten you. I don't know about it's you. It's so crazy. This is scary. I'm going to close this guy here just so that you can uh, see. So this is just really North America, okay, that you can kind of, you can see, you know, if we just kind of zoom in a little bit, massive population down the East Coast massive population down the west coast of um, these clinics so it does seem incredibly strategic doesn't it and if you hover over my, my map you know this is the one who uh, you know you, you see here true stories of what exactly has happened so a girl uh, was questioning her sexuality she's taken to the doctor and given lupron okay so this is just uh, this is just unreal. It's the, the level of medical experiments that we're now doing on our young people uh, and our children and uh, women is really, quite, is really quite insane. 
I think that at every point we really need to be exposing this because we're going to see a big backpedaling uh, from many organizations and from many individuals who previously supported this. So it's, it's so vital that we document everything so that we can really hold their feet to the fire um, when they start to say to us in 10 years, no, I never went along with gender identity. I, I never did any of this stuff. So we need to say, no, actually, yes, you did. You were massively complicit. This is going to bring so many organizations tumbling down. So some, probably some good organizations as well, but it, it's just going to have such a knock-on effect in, I think, destabilizing the integrity of the health industry in general or of health professionals because if they were able to go along with something such as suggesting that there is such a thing as a third sex then we can never trust we can't trust them to operate on our hearts we can't trust them for anything so this is i i personally feel that this is going to destabilize the 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 entire concept of the kind of the the patriarchal healer yeah, that's a great point. And, and it's, it's happening on so many fronts already. I mean, in, in my world, the women that I work with are deeply mistrustful of white coat authority. Uh, you know, they're well informed about the uh, disturbing nature of industrial birth and the objectification of, wo of women and using women as objects and uh, as guinea pigs for exp experimental uh, you know, what would be called medical treatment, um, you know, even what is considered prenatal care is actually ritualized abuse and grooming for the complete subordination that women experience um, in industrial birth. So, uh, you know, I think for, for women who have been through, through and abused the, the medical healthcare model, this is quite on point who have been abused by pharmaceutical drugs, who have been put on antidepressants for years and years and years or hormonal birth control. And it is even beyond, I mean, even Lupron, I mean, Lupron, you know, women who, who work in reproductive health, um, you know, are familiar with Lupron. And I just spoke with a woman the other day who, who remarked that she's on a couple Facebook groups of women who are recovering from um, injury induced by Lupron. So these are groups of women uh, who are not trans identified, who, who have been on Lupron for some, you know, some a short period, some long period, whose teeth are falling out at age 20. So, oh you know, these, these young kids who are on Lupron, trans identified, I mean, it's really hard for a child to fathom a long-term result if, you know, if they're not having an immediate Kind of reaction to these evil drugs you know we, we don't know what is or we do know i should say what happens down the line based mm -hmm. on what has happened in the past for non-trans identified you know people taking taking lupron and, and yeah this one that you have pulled up now prescribed testosterone to an older grieving woman at age 40 with a long undocumented and complicated history of mental illness i mean what this is the standard that we have in this country for helping people yeah yeah. This is, that, I this think is criminal. It, it's so criminal. Some of these individuals, have uh, lives have been destroyed, I think. The knock-on effect that this has on a family is so profound because when somebody does have faith in doctors to do good, okay, first do no harm, right? That was former oath. But so imagine that your son, this case actually is of a son, is going through something strange and they're expressing themselves and they're having deep distress over their body and you take them to the doctor and they do something as terrible as what happened to this, this person. So um, this mother, it says, the doctor on staff prescribed my son with female hormones is blank blank. Uh, the therapist on staff, I had a one hour consultation. As soon as I walked in, she handed me suicide statistics and a paper about why I should support my son's transition. I asked her if she can look into any underlying issues that may have triggered the gender confusion or look into ADHD. The doctor then said she wasn't required to do so. Wow. I asked her to help him feel comfortable in his body and to avoid lifetime meds and surgeries. She said she can't do that because New Jersey has a, conver a conversion therapy 
law. So the conversion therapy law, we know this is the biggest perversion ever of language and um, of taking the same approach that, you know, to, to compare trying to fix a girl's or a boy's intense discomfort in their body to electroshocking uh, a gay person. It's just, the, it's so perverse and disgusting. Um, and all of these conversion therapy bans, they weren't introduced in the 80s when people really were doing this stuff to people. They introduce it now to protect gender identity. That really uh, angers me and upsets me. So I think that we all need to, to talk about this. Uh, we all need to talk about what is happening. And this is so frightening. The number of detransitioners every day is growing. There's now 17,000 on Reddit. So that's 17,000 that are saying, this is what happened. Uh, this is what happened to me. And it was wrong. The medical negligence, there's going to be so many key cases that are going to happen that really we could, uh, as a society, we might never uh, look the same after this. Yeah, this is, this is eugenics. Uh, this is absolutely yeah. eugenics. This is disgusting. It is sterilization. It has just found a new, yeah, a new catalyst, you know? Yeah, it's a just new catalyst. More sterilization. So, so genius as well. I mean, if you were to think about, uh, if you were to think about this idea of, um, you know, it, it's almost like an evil plot that people sat down and they said, how are we going to capture an entire generation of women uh, how are we going to do this? Oh, let's start to tell them they're deeply flawed and they were born in the wrong body and let's create a massive movement behind it. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's almost like it's from a science fiction movie. It's no less crazy. Well, the narrative, you know, I think what happened partly of why it's taken off too is because the narrative around like women only look like this or do this was, you know, was, was losing traction. And so within the trans movement, there is uh, a varied, you know, it, it, the way that you can present is infinite in yeah. some sense. I mean, it, it reinforces a binary. It doesn't mm -hmm. subvert a binary. There's more, yeah, I just think the narrative around, you know, women only have big boobs and small waists and big mm -hmm. butts like that just got old. Like people started to catch on like that. That's not going to fly anymore. We, we already significantly, we made as much money as we could make on that front through breast implants, you know, with women coming forward and, and getting their implants removed and the danger with, with, with that alone. Right. So like that, that's kind of come more into people's consciousness, but then there's this whole other thing, you know, and who wants to be a bigot, right? Who wants mm -hmm. to be labeled homophobic, transphobic? Yeah. So it, it really Nobody pulls, no, it, it really targets women in, in, the, in our empathy, in our desire to accept and be loving and nurturing, mm -hmm. like, you know, the mothers who are going along with it. You know, we, we mostly are involved with mothers who are trying to stop it from happening mm -hmm. and then but i but then i wonder you know i wonder about the mothers who are unknowingly grooming their kids for a lifelong uh you know kind of medical yeah. intervention and also if there's a part of it that they're writing off you know in terms of the virtue like are they putting a blind eye like have they been so significantly brainwashed or is it like narcissism or is it like the, the accolades and the kind of um, attention one gets from having a trans kid, you know, all these celebrities coming out and saying that their kids are trans. It's just, it, it, it's so it's tokenizing. Uh, tokenizing. Yeah. A hundred percent. And also um, think about how much Cher was, um, was villainized for uh, not accepting that her daughter was really a, a, a son. Uh, she was really villainized for not mm. wanting to go, go along with this whole thing. And how was Khloe Kardashian framed? Uh, that was mm. that was also a big indicator. Yes. Yeah. Women are mean. Women are and mean. Chris, yeah. Women, yeah, women are hurtful. We're taught this all the time. Chicks are crazy. Chicks are bad. Women are bad. They're mean. She's mean. She won't call the man she. She's a mean woman. So that's why we have words like turf. 
Because men can't be TERFs, obviously, because men cannot be a radical feminist because it's just a women's liberation movement and that's it. Um, and there is no TERF word in for men. What's the equivalent of a male TERF? There is none. There that's, isn't, it, yeah. This is a, an attack on women, attack on our language, attack on our bodies, attack on our rights, an attack on everything. And uh, there's, there's on no fronts and in no ways do I think it's appropriate for us to go along with even a, even a small part of this. So that can be down to uh, going along with pronouns. Don't do it. Until they stop doing the experiments on the children and inculcating our, our sisters, I'm not going to go along with pronouns and I'm just not, I'm not going to do it. If we can roll it back a little bit where I can start to um, maybe go along with some aspects that some men have to kind of do this, all right, I'll, I'll do it. And maybe I'll change my language. I would be willing to concede, but not now, not willing to concede anything to these people. No, every word, every word is a chance to assert mm -hmm. your belief system and then to be giving away language as we've been groomed to do through this ideology is, yeah, we have to stop. And we have a lot of power in our, in, in our language too. And it's the consequence of, of all of this, one of the many negative consequences is that so many women are afraid to speak at all because they are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It is paralyzing by design. It is silencing by design. Actually, one thing I wanted to uh, mentioned with Willow that when she, and I, and I imagine this is the case for a lot of young women who take testosterone, is that they have a false sense of protection. So because they can move about the world, in some cases passing as men, they believe that they should go into the male bathroom, which is absurd because they are prone to violence. Now, if they go into a woman's bathroom and a woman gets scared and says, you're a man, you know, that could be resolved re relatively quickly. And that woman wouldn't be, the, the woman who's presenting as male, wouldn't be in a physical threat by doing yeah. so, right? So it, it, might, it might result in tension and conflict and uh, confrontation. But yeah, I, I also see the danger, not only in the hormones, but in the kind of mind control that, that it promotes in, in that some women, like Willow, you know, says that she didn't think she was a trans man. She thought she was a man. And cool. men, right, men use men's bathroom. That part of her story struck me so deeply and in, in that she was then choosing to put herself in harm's way, you know, taking a risk that, you know, obviously should only pee in the stall. That as soon as one of these men found out that no, she's actually a woman, you know, it would be over, it would be done. She, you know, it's, it puts these women in, in, in danger in so many ways that, mm -hmm. that, that even, you know, would go beyond the irreversible, you know, medical treatments, but actually put them yeah. in physical harm's way um, and, and make them potentially even more susceptible uh, to male violence, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it, it does give it, you're right. So Willow is not an exception in the fact that she believed that she was going to be literally a, a male individual. I hear about um, girls write to me all the time telling me that not only did they believe that they were gay men, they believed that they would be entirely accepted into that dating pool. And the, the level of um, reject that they do face uh, when they go out into the dating scene is extreme. The number, the number of men, young gay men, who are expressing uh, their deep disdain for these women on their dating apps is profound and it's suppressed. It is suppressed. The pink news and all of this nonsense, they will never talk about um, the men who are being, in some cases, assaulted. I know it's very, it's mental gymnastics to get there because we don't think of women as being predators, but I think that some of this is predatory behavior. To these younger men, they're never reporting on it. They're never talking about it. The people were talking about the cost and ceiling in 2014. Show me a mainstream news source, which has run with this story. Nobody's talked about it. Everybody, the so-called uh, cis people, are all being terrorized by this it, on every level. It's such an authoritarian movement, uh, controlling our language, 
controlling our young people. And that's why we have to stand up for it on all levels. When people come back and they say, well, you know, some people are true trans. Well, I think that that is super dangerous as well. And I have to really question the sanity, I think, of anybody who at this point still believes in the concept of a true trans. I agree. I also don't believe there's a true, true trans. Yeah. It's, it's kind of absurd. And yeah, what you're speaking to in terms of the gay men being coerced into having sex with women. Yeah, it's happening to women too. Like obviously the, the, the like lesbians, as you mentioned. I mean, if you want to talk about conversion, that is. <laughs> that's conversion you know I, that is absurd i've received you know i've spoken about it, my my kind of encounters with this on dating apps and i've received messages from women after kind of critiquing what's happening saying that i just have to get over my sexual fears that me oh, no, not you, wanting yeah. to have sex with another woman because i'm heterosexual is indicative of my internalized transphobia. When it's yeah. just, in, it's just the reality is that I'm not a lesbian. Just as a lesbian who doesn't want to have sex with a man who presents as a woman, like she's, it's because she's a lesbian. It's because she's same sex attracted. So this is, this is, yeah. this is conversion therapy. Yeah. And it's also, um, you know, you need, you, there's another group of people that you didn't talk about here, and that's the bisexuals, because you're not mm. even allowed to be a bisexual anymore, because a bisexual right. is trans-exclusionary. And the thing is, I think there's a lot of dishonesty going along here, because anybody who says, yes, uh, I'm, I'm a gay man, and I would go out with a, a, a trans-identified female, um, I think there's a lot of lying going on, because I don't think that they truly are. And then also, when you take uh, invading, let's say, of the, the, the bisexuals, um, they want to love people who are one, uh, one sex from head to toe, not people who are a, a, mis, a, a mish, mishmash of, 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 of identities. There's been a female erasure, obviously, but also I'd say to a very large extent, they've erased the concept of being straight and erased the concept of being gay to the point where we can no longer even talk about what is, what is homophobia, right? Because it's all transphobia. It's so completely ridiculous. But it's happening. It's happening in a big way. I have a friend who was assaulted by a trans identified man on a dating app. So, you know, that, that's, that, that's pretty serious. Uh, it's not pretty serious. It's very, very serious. And she didn't feel comfortable to even come out to her closest friends and say that this has happened out of fear for being labeled a transphobe. <sighs> right, it's just another way for men to access women, you know, to have yeah. impunity from, yeah, being held accountable and it's, it's, it's revolting and, mm -hmm. oh, so what can women listening do? How can they get involved? How can mm -hmm. they, yeah, I think that's a really good point because a lot of us do feel very, uh, a lot of us do feel very um, uh, helpless in this. Okay, so first of all, one of the first things you can do is um, talk about it with your friends. Um, if you are in a group of, of females who are perhaps eating some of this up, talk to them in ways that are small that they can start to understand. So talk to them about the cotton ceiling talk to them about the boxer ceiling, ask them some very simple questions. Like, don't you think it's a little bit strange that so many young girls who are suffering from eating disorders are now uh, identifying as, as males and going on testosterone? Because I think that a lot of girls, a lot of females very much understand the reality of girlhood and how completely seducing that idea is. Uh, I think these are easy ways to talk to your girlfriends. And then in terms of being, uh, if you are a detransitioner or if you are, if you have been affected directly by this, go to my map 
and log your gender offenders. That's incredibly important. There have been such reams of nonsense written and done that we're going to have to do quite a lot to counteract it. So if you're a, a if you can start your own YouTube channel like you've done, or if you can go onto Medium and start writing some articles and start to correct some of the narrative uh, about this, I think it's incredibly important. And if you are in the gender critical closet, I think it's high time you come out because come out and support your sisters, come out and support your, come out and support yourself, I think, because if we're all going to look honestly at this, uh, I don't think any women can at this point go along with it. I think we have to really hold the reins uh, and just say no more. I'm not taking any more of this nonsense and abuse and I'm not going to watch my sisters take it for sure. There is a world, as you mentioned, 17,000 on Reddit who are detransitioned. I mean, mm -hmm. that is unbelievable in itself. So for anyone who thinks that they can avoid what is happening or not be involved, I actually think is naive at this point, you mm -hmm. know, because yeah. if it's not for yourself, it's for your daughter, it's for your sister, your niece, you know, it's for all of us, because this ideology, this extremism is insidious and, mm -hmm. you know, is a part of a, a kind of, a, I think, a more of a, a global takeover of what it means to be human. Definitely. It's so, it's just so regressive. It's so oppressive. We just totally need to just like ditch it like, like we would an old religion, ditch it like the cult that it is.